some ID, any type of ID, is better than having no identification at all. That's not trying to bastardize the result. I love Beyonce, but 18 hours is no. <laughs> Special counsel Robert Mueller is in discussions for an interview with Russian pop star Emin Agalarov, who helped broker a meeting between Trump campaign officials and a Russian lawyer in June 2016. Agalarov's lawyer says both parties haven't yet reached an agreement. When Vice News interviewed Agalarov last month, he told us how he set up the meeting between Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort, and Russian lawyer Natalia Visolnitskaya. I set that meeting up. I know what that meeting was about. It was about nothing. The Catholic Church has updated its official teachings to oppose the death penalty in all cases, calling it a, quote, attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. The Catechism previously endorsed executions if it was the only way to protect lives. Pope Francis says the Church will work to abolish capital punishment, which is still legal in 53 countries. Apple has become the first trillion-dollar company in the world, which is certainly a lot more impressive than yesterday, when it was worth a paltry $976 billion. Catcallers in France will now face on-the-spot fines of up to $870 after the country outlawed sexual harassment on the street. The law, which was submitted to Parliament in March, passed four days after a video of a woman being attacked by a catcaller in Paris went viral. The Trump administration announced its official proposal to roll back Obama-era limits on pollution from cars and small trucks. The changes, which target the corporate average fuel economy, or CAFE standards, would freeze fuel economy standards at the 2020 level and get rid of a special status that California has had since the 70s, which allows the state to set its own standards and basically lead the country when it comes to car emissions. But first, the Trump administration has to sell the proposal. To do that, Secretaries Chow and Wheeler co-wrote this creatively titled op-ed to lay out their plan. But the real way it's selling the rollback is by making an argument that dirtier cars make you safer. The proposal suggests that less efficient cars could reduce highway fatalities by up to 1,000 deaths a year. How would that work? The administration says more stringent fuel standards make cars more expensive. And that means people keep their old cars for longer instead of buying newer, safer cars. It also says that under its proposal, people would drive less because they would own gas guzzlers that are more expensive to drive. And that would therefore lead to fewer cars on the road and fewer accidents. So, voila. Preventing tougher fuel standards saves lives. But this doesn't actually make sense. For one thing, the fuel efficiency standards have been in place since 2012 and the U.S. has had record car sales in the years since. So a lot of people do, in fact, have newer cars. And if you ask one of the EPA advisors who worked on the Obama rule, the way the administration came up with the number of lives saved is very strange. It's a very, very deceptive argument. About 90% of what they call the saved fatalities are simply due to their grand assumption, this make-believe assumption that American drivers will drive about three trillion fewer miles if they freeze the standards and they would otherwise drive under the current standards we have on the books, which is obviously ridiculous. The administration also suggests that fuel-efficient cars are more expensive, so their proposal will mean huge savings for Americans. But it's clear that the administration isn't taking into account the environmental impact and the resulting costs of having a ton of gas guzzlers on the road. After all, when it comes to transportation, the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions are passenger cars. The tightened fuel economy standards were the single greatest accomplishment of the Obama administration in terms of fighting climate change. And now Trump is trying to undo that. Uh, that will have very considerable costs in human lives. Mm -hmm. 
sanctuary cities just got a little bit safer. Judges ruled against President Trump's 2017 executive order, saying the government would withhold funding from cities that don't cooperate with ICE. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled yesterday that only Congress can block federal funding. The Department of Justice called the ruling a victory for criminal aliens. Some state governments are opposed to sanctuary policies too. Texas Senate Bill 4, known as the Show Me Your Papers Law, allows officers to ask anyone they detain to reveal their immigration status. And opponents say it's enough to keep immigrants from asking for help or reporting crimes. So Catholic parishes in Dallas came up with an idea. They'd start issuing IDs themselves. What sorts of challenges does it present in life to not have a state-issued identification? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like day and night to enroll your kids in school, uh, to go to a doctor, open an, a bank account. If you don't have that, it's really hard. I'm part of a group of people at the church that have been working with the parish ID. We make the announcements at the mass that we are gonna be signing people who are interested in, in getting the parish ID. In the first instance, we have 1,600 people sign up, plus 1,000 new members. It will not be recognized as an official form of identification, but it will be recognized as a form of identification. So is that a yes? Yes. The idea for parish ID cards was proposed last fall in a meeting between Dallas area police officers and members of the faith community. Josephine Paul has been a lead organizer in Dallas's immigrant community for over 15 years and has strongly opposed SB4 since its inception. In the listening sessions, we learned that the, the most pervasive fear that immigrants had was to report a crime. Many had been victims of crime. And also, if they had an encounter with a police officer, how they would identify themselves. So as soon as we kind of understood that, then we began um, you know, building on the political work that we've been doing with the Dallas Police Department. We often send our kids to, to school, and the first identification they might get is uh, is a student ID, you know, and so that gives them some sense of this is who I am, you know, and the school route for me. So I guess with them, this gives them a sense of this is who I am and my church vouch for me. It has no legal binding, we understand that, but it's not from our perspective that it matters as it does to, to them. Esto en el acuerdo que por parte de la iglesia de la diosa de Dallas se hizo con la policía de que ustedes tuvieran un documento en dado caso de que al ir conduciendo les diera una infracción y no tuvieran ustedes con qué identificarse, no los iba a llevar a inmigración, sino que les iba a dar simplemente la identificación, digo la, la amonestación, si tenían ustedes esa identificación. If a police officer in the Dallas Police Department decides that he wants to follow the letter of Senate Bill 4 mm -hmm. and that he does not want to accept parish IDs, will that officer be reprimanded? Oh, of course not. I mean, with officer using their discretion, you know, they can weigh in on the totality of the circumstances in which they come in contact with the person. That goes back to saying some ID, any type of ID, is better than having no identification at all. The Parish ID program started so that undocumented immigrants will feel more comfortable talking to the police, right? If it is up to every single individual officer's personal discretion whether or not to accept Parish IDs, don't you think there's some fear that you're actually putting like a false hope in some of these undocumented immigrants by just giving them something that doesn't have to be actually accepted? 
To them reporting a crime is just as important as anyone else in this community reporting a crime. Our job is to try to create the safest community in the country. And so and it, it requires trust, and it's, it requires building trust. Do you think that Senate Bill 4 then has eroded some of the trust between law enforcement and undocumented communities? I'm not going to comment on that. Tienes hambre, Andrea? Sí. I feel more comfortable in case a policeman need uh, something. With my photo, that it was issued here. For the church to, to be doing this for us is a sense of hope that um, we have people who really care. And that's different, especially in the times we're living. Nangagwa Emerson Dambuzo of ZANU PF Party is therefore duly declared elected president of the Republic of Zimbabwe with effect from the 3rd of August 2018. Today, Zimbabwe's Election Commission announced that Emerson Mnangagwa has won the race for president. But he's been doing that job since November, when he took over from his longtime ally, Robert Mugabe, after a coup ended the dictator's 38-year rule. Anticipating the news, the military and police put the capital city Harare on lockdown after at least six people died in protests on Wednesday. The protesters support Manangagwa's opposition, the MDC party. Their presidential candidate, Nelson Shimisa, says he won the popular vote, and he's accused the election commission of delaying its announcement to rig the results. Because that's now rigging, that's now manipulation. That's now trying to bastardize the result. The ruling ZANU-PF party says Shimisa is responsible for the violence because he declared victory a day after the polls closed, but before results had been finalized. We hold the opposition MDC alliance and its whole leadership responsible for this disturbance of national peace, which was meant to disrupt the electoral process. The vote itself was relatively peaceful, and the election commission says turnout was high, at 75% of voters. But EU observers noticed irregularities. While political rights were largely respected, there was, were concerns regarding the environment for the polls. The election was supposed to be an opportunity for Zimbabwe to start fresh and focus on bigger challenges. People don't want to see bickering about the results for the next two, three weeks. You know, the, the, the economy can't wait as people bicker about the results. In other words, I think it's going to be more about expediency. Now, Menangagwa has the difficult task of trying to unite a divided country where voters have reason not to trust the government or his party. There was such a sense of optimism about, about the election, a, a real hope. People were really hoping that this election would build political reconciliation. We've been through this. It's a real sense of deja vu and disappointment. It's vacation season for British politicians. But if you're in Theresa May's government, the chances are that this year, you're not heading to the beach to chill, you're heading to Europe to talk Brexit. A week ago, the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, rejected May's proposal for how Brexit would work. So now, one of the world's least charismatic heads of state is on a charm offensive to save Brexit and her own political career. She met with the leaders of Austria, the Czech Republic, and Estonia last Friday, and she's sending ministers on hastily scheduled visits to Germany, Spain, and Italy. Four of her top team have traveled to France in the last week. And tomorrow, May is cutting short her own holiday to meet the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Why is Theresa May focusing her attention on France? 
France has been the toughest on Brexit so far. Um, and uh, the leader of the European Commission, who's leading the talks, Michel Barnier, has had a very tough line. And he's taking his directions really from France and Germany. Um, and Theresa May's plan is to try and undercut the European Commission and go straight to the member states and try and encourage them to put pressure on Barnier to be a lot softer. The nightmare scenario here is the no deal scenario. No deal scenario means absolute chaos. Chaos at the ports, airlines not being able to fly to EU destinations. Um, it means that there are big risks to the UK's uh, food supply chain. There would be problems in the city of London because there are all of these derivatives contracts and without EU law, they would no longer be valid and there would be a huge amount of litigation. That all might seem far-fetched, but the no-deal scenario actually appears to be getting more real by the day. The two sides can't agree on the enormously difficult business of who would collect what tariffs on what goods. And even if May could convince the Europeans to accept her approach, she's having even worse luck at home. David Davis, the UK's Brexit point man, and Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, both quit in protest over May's plan. It is not too late to save Brexit. She doesn't have a legislative majority, and even her own party is basically split in half between the Brexiteers like Boris, who think her soft version of Brexit doesn't change anywhere near enough, and the Remainers, who wish this whole thing never happened in the first place. To make matters worse, Britain and Europe have already set a deadline to figure this out by the end of October. If May can't get it done, her government will almost certainly collapse, and there'll be fresh elections, probably a new prime minister tasked with cleaning up the mess. The best chance of avoiding that convincing European heads of state to change their minds and having them pressure EU negotiators to change theirs. Which is why the government's summer holiday is officially over. Musicians make just fractions of a penny every time their song gets played on a music streaming platform. But in 2015, one company launched with a promise to put profits and power back in the hands of artists. If these artists can sit in a room together, it's, the game changes. And it happened today. After Jay-Z bought the Norwegian streaming site Tidal for $56 million, he brought on 15 artists and bands as stakeholders. But when Tidal released data on its listeners in 2016, the numbers didn't quite add up. Tidal said its 3 million subscribers streamed Kanye West's The Life of Pablo more than 250 million times in 10 days, and Beyonce's Lemonade more than 300 million times in 15 days. Reporters at a Norwegian paper, Dagens Naringsleaf, were suspicious of those numbers. Hi. After receiving a hard drive from an alleged whistleblower, they hired Katrin Frank to investigate. Digital Forensics Laboratory. Here is where it's happened. So we are the crazy knowledgeable people in the basement who do analysis of fraud, of data. Her team found unusual listening patterns in Tidal's user data from Kanye and Beyonce's latest albums. When we got the data, we saw there's a huge amount of records being uh, registered uh, in the log files where we wondered what is going on here? Why is this huge amount of records suddenly there? There are multiple timestamps which have exactly hour, minute, second, millisecond. And they had all the same user ID and they had all the track record, which would imply this one user needs to have 60 devices where he pushes at the same millisecond the button to play the favorite record. Likely? Mm -mm. Franke and her team say around 320 million streams across 1.7 million accounts look suspicious. The data appear to show users listening to tracks in the same patterns over and over again throughout the same day. Oh, oh wow. Okay, I see what you mean by the duplications. One of those accounts is owned by Jeremy Simmons. He lives in Maryland and adores Beyonce. Vice News combed the data from the leaked hard drive. It showed he listened to Lemonade for 18 hours on one day in April 2016. Yikes, there's no way. I love Beyonce, but 18 hours is... No, <laughs> that leaves six hours of the day. <laughs> in 2016, Tidal reportedly paid Universal $2.2 million 
for streams of Kanye's album through March, and Sony $2.5 million for streams of Beyoncé's Lemonade through May. Fake or not, the recorded streams translated into real revenue and concentrated it in the hands of two very powerful artists. That's because musicians don't earn a set amount every time a song is streamed. They get a share of what Tidal makes. So false plays can skew the proportion, effectively pulling money away from smaller labels or independent artists. Tidal has previously disputed these claims. Tono, a company that represents more than 2.5 million songwriters worldwide, was the first of four associations to file a complaint against Tidal to the Norwegian police. What I'm hearing from the customers is that they are skeptical now to, to Tidal and can we, can we trust the other music services? So it's serious for the, for the whole music business, I believe. And that is the reason for us to, to take this case to the police. Tidal denies the claims and told us that the information on the hard drive was stolen and manipulated, and that it would vigorously fight the allegations made by Dagens Naringsleaf, which it accuses of launching a smear campaign. Tidal also says they hired an independent cybersecurity firm to investigate what it calls a data breach. Vice News made multiple requests for interviews and comments with Tidal, its artist owners, and Sprint, which has a 33% stake in the company. Some of the musicians refused to give us a comment, while others did not respond to our request. I would, yeah, basically ask, what are you going to do about this? Is it true? Is it not true? I just want them to make it right. If you didn't know it was wrong, now you do. These are the 60 or so new recruits who are joining the Aden security forces. 